morning, Vineyard Milwaukee. Merry Christmas. I know this was a very different Christmas this year, but I hope that you found some special ways to celebrate or at least reflect on the miracle of Christmas, on God breaking into the darkness and becoming the light for us, um, actually taking on flesh and becoming a human being. And this Christmas, rather than us sharing our own Christmas message with you this Sunday, we wanted to um, instead share a message from my former senior pastor, Rich Nathan, who was the senior pastor at Vineyard Columbus for a long time, um, for the 15 years that I was there. And this past Christmas Eve, he actually preached his last sermon as the senior pastor at Vineyard Columbus. And I listened to it on Christmas Day, and it's just a beautiful message about um, the miracle of God putting on flesh and becoming a human being and what that means for us, that we worship a God that became one of us and that he experienced all of what it means to be human and that that is the God we worship. And so I wanted to share this message with you this week. Merry Christmas. It's so wonderful to be with you this Christmas Eve. And this may be my last Christmas Eve sermon, but uh, it certainly will be my last Christmas Eve message as your senior pastor. And so Merry Christmas. I love you. You know, I read a story some years ago about a uh, Kansas family. It was They were living in a farming community and uh, a tornado had ripped through their town and actually destroyed this farming family's home. Well, after that, uh, the little girl in the family was scared every time there was a storm and she thought a tornado was coming. And one night there was a terrible thunderstorm, lightning flashed, the windows rattled from the, the uh, wind and, and the sky grew dark and threatening and the little girl was really frightened. At bedtime, her dad walked her upstairs, tucked her in and, and went downstairs from the living room. He and his wife could hear their daughter crying. And so he went upstairs and he said to her, honey, listen, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be scared. It's just a thunderstorm. And, and now you go to sleep. Don't be afraid. Little girl looked at him and he, she said, daddy, it's okay for you to say that, but you don't know what it's like to be little. Well, the amazing thing about Christmas is that we worship a God at Christmas who doesn't just come to our rooms and tell us not to be afraid. We worship a God at Christmas. We sing Christmas carols and we do everything around Christmas because we worship a God who knows what it's like to be little. He became like us. And uh, the God we worship at Christmas, the God that we sing Christmas carols about, uh, the God we pray to, the God that uh, we praise, knows what it's like to be scared at thunderstorms and knows what it's like to be a child and to be bullied, to have stomach aches and headaches and, and grow up and be rejected. Uh, he knows loneliness. He knows fear. He lived in a world of epidemics and racial violence and all of the stuff that we go through that God knows what it's like to be little. What uh, we're going to do this evening is we're going to look at a very famous Christmas carol. Uh, it's called, O Come All Ye Faithful, and I'm going to quote one verse from that Christmas carol. It reads this way. Word of the Father now in flesh appearing. O come let us adore him. Before we turn to God's word, I'd like you to join me and we're going to pray to God together. Let's pray. And would you bring yourself and if you have children with you watching, would you, would you put your hand on your child and bless them even as I pray, if you're a couple, just hold hands and bless each other. 
And we confess, Lord, as we come this Christmas Eve that uh, this has been a hard year. Lord, it's been a year of isolation and loneliness. It's been a year of sickness and death. It's, it's been a hard year, Lord. And we thank you, God, that you don't leave us alone, but that in dark places your light shines. And we ask you, Lord, for your blessing this Christmas Eve. We ask blessing on every child who's in this church, every child watching, every teen, every single adult, Lord, our families extended through the nation and the world, and Lord, uh, our friends, wherever they may be, we ask blessing. We ask blessing on this service, and I pray blessing on this word in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read to you from the opening words of the Gospel of John. And for those of you who are Bible readers, these words will be very familiar to you. The Gospel writer John begins this way, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. Now, who was the baby born in Bethlehem 2,000 plus years ago, whose birthday we celebrate at Christmas? Here's what John says. In the beginning was the Word. Now, why does John call Jesus the Word? Whole volumes have been written by scholars about the meaning of this one phrase, in the beginning was the Word. And uh, the concept of the word is traced through Greek philosophy and Roman philosophy and Gnostic philosophy and even Jewish philosophy. And what John is saying is that what the Greeks and the Romans and the Jews and the Gnostics all longed for, what they were searching for in this concept of the word has found its goal, has found its fulfillment in this one that we call Jesus. John is saying that the longing of every philosophical system, the longing of every religious person who takes their religious religion seriously, what the Greeks long for, what the Romans long for, what the Gnostics long for, what the Jews long for, that it finds fulfillment in Jesus. This one that John calls the Word. Or to update this, what everyone in the world is looking for now. What we long for in terms of fulfillment, what uh, we're searching for in another relationship with another person, whether we're searching for validation through grades or through uh, money or through work, our search for happiness, our search for peace, our search for love, all of our searches find their answer in Jesus. And whether we know it or not, we're all looking for God. A guy sitting at a bar at night drinking alone may not even know what he's looking for in that glass, but ultimately what he needs and what he's looking for is God. A teenager who's longing for their boyfriend or girlfriend to say, I love you, whether they know it or not, is looking for God. So is everyone in the world who's searching for fulfillment who may not even know that they were made by God and for God. Nevertheless, there is this longing inside that can only be satisfied by the one John calls the Word. And so John begins his gospel, in the beginning was the Word. Now, how do we find out what God is like? Well, John answers this way, just as the words of a man or woman tell you, express to you something of that man or woman, that if a person didn't speak, they would remain a mystery, so it is with God. God has chosen to express himself. God has chosen to speak. And so it is the nature of the Christian God to speak. Our God is there and he is not silent. 
And here's the deal. You know, a lot of people who don't know very much about Christianity or think they know about Christianity but really don't, a lot of people believe that Christianity is like all of the rest of the religions, that, that essentially that we as human beings are all blind and we're groping in the dark for a God who remains hidden and elusive, that if there is some God out there, if he or she or it or whatever God is, is out there, we can't know it. And we're all just trying to explain the unexplainable. A lot of folks have talked to me about Christianity and they say, well, isn't it the case that Christianity is just trying to, you know, it's our human attempt to, to answer mysteries in life that, that we human beings have questions and, and, and so we project up to the sky some answer and Christianity is one of those projections that you know we we struggle with well what does happen to us after we die and how do we explain suffering especially for good people and and all of the deaths and and you know that that we all of the losses we experience and there's so many mysteries in life and and Christianity is just one other attempt to explain the unexplainable but ultimately we're all just grasping at wind and we're making it up as we go and this first phrase of the Apostle John just blows this idea out of the water. Because John says something about the true and living God. And John says that this true and living God does not remain hidden. That we're not just grasping in the dark like blind people for a God who is hiding. That in fact... It's not God who's hiding at all. There is a game of hide and seek going on, but we're the ones who are hiding, and God is the one who's constantly seeking. We're hiding in the basement somewhere in the dark, and God comes after us with a gigantic searchlight. He pushes all the clothes away in the wardrobe where we're hiding, hiding and he says, found ya, gotcha. That's the way that Christianity works. It's not us reaching out for God as we imagine. Rather, it's God reaching down to us, seeking us out. And let me drop this down for a moment so that you all understand what we mean by in the beginning was the word. Because it changes everything. I want to talk to those of you who are children Families, you may have children watching right now. You may have a teenager watching. Many of you have dogs. And I want you to imagine that one day, kids, teens, you came home and your dog greets you at the door, but instead of just wagging his tail, he talks to you. And he says, how was your day? Did you have a hard day at school again? Is... Um, Oh, Sophia being mean to you? Is Liam still bullying you? Was school boring? Or if you're an adult and you came home, the dog greets you and he says, wow, was traffic really bad out there? I was a little worried when I saw it raining so hard. I thought, oh gosh, you're going to be stuck in traffic. How was it? Your relationship with your dog would really change if your dog talked to you. However much you think you understand your dog, however much you think your dog understands you or your moods, I tell you, your relationship with your dog would totally change if your dog spoke to you. And our relationship with God totally changes because our God speaks. He is there and he is not silent. In fact, the Bible again says if anyone is playing hide and seek, it is not God. It's us. We are running away from God and God is coming after us. And because God speaks and because God is always looking for us, 
He spoke to us in the one that John calls the Word. John continues, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was God. What an extraordinary statement, the Word was God. You know, my favorite author, C.S. Lewis, said that we always need to remember who it is that was running around the Roman Empire saying the word was God. What is extraordinary about this claim that Jesus is God is that the person who wrote this and the people who were saying it were the least likely people on the face of the earth to have claimed this if it wasn't true. See, the people who were running around the Roman Empire claiming that Jesus is God and the folks who wrote almost all of the New Testament were Jewish people. And if ever there was a group of people who, because of their history, because of their tradition, because of their frame of mind, were completely disinclined to believe that a man could be God or to bow down and worship a man, it was Jewish people. You see, uh, for nearly 2,000 years, Jews understood that there was only one God and that God was not a man. In fact, when Romans would walk by an Orthodox Jewish person, the Orthodox Jewish person would turn and spit on the ground because that Roman was a pagan who worshipped men, the emperor, as if they were God. And that was so distasteful, that was so disgusting to Jewish folks that they couldn't conceive of it. Every single Jew got up in the morning praying the words, the ancient words from the book of Deuteronomy that Jews call the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And Orthodox Jews continue that practice today. And so it was these Jewish people who believed that God was one, who would never bow down before a man and call that man Lord or God. It was the same Jewish people, so disinclined to believe this, that were going around saying, but Jesus is Lord. And Jesus is God. And if I can use an analogy, it would be like a rabid Buckeye fan going up to Ann Arbor, Michigan, leading the University of Michigan pep rally and singing Hail to the Victors. It would be like a Yankees fan going to Fenway Park, you know, with a Red Sox cap and Red Sox gear on and leading the chant, you know, you know, go Red Sox, go. I mean, even saying that makes me want to throw up in my mouth. Jesus comes to us at Christmas. And some of the same Jews who so hated the Romans for worshiping a man as God were saying, but this man is God. And they were bowing down to him. And they're seeking him for forgiveness. Jesus is Lord. Do you know how convincing Jesus must have been to overwhelm these Jewish people's minds and overwhelm their hearts so that they would say that? Do you know how much evidence would have had to be presented to such a biased jury to get them to vote in favor of Jesus? What was it that Jesus said? What was it that he did that persuaded Jews to worship him as Lord? Was it his miracles over nature that they saw him walking on water or stilling a storm by a word? Was it watching Jesus forgive people's sins? Maybe it was watching Jesus die on a cross and watching the way he died, forgiving his enemies and being kind to a thief who was being crucified next to him. Maybe it was his resurrection from the dead. Maybe it was all of it put together. But Jesus presented such overwhelming evidence that Jewish people said 
Jesus is God because it was true. Why is it important to call Jesus God? John says this in verse 18. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Why is it important to call Jesus God? Well, first of all, because it's true. You know, we live in a post-truth culture, at least that's what all the commentators say, and, and many, many folks are inclined to believe something these days, not because it's true, but because people like them believe it. Because folks who share our political tribe believe it. Because we prefer that it was that way, so we believe that it's true. Well, we Christians, we reject this post-truth culture. We are people who don't believe something because we prefer it to be that way or because people like us say that it is like this, so therefore we say it also, we Christians are people who love reality. We want to believe things because they're true, because this is the way reality is structured, because this is the world we live in. And if you are a person who wants to embrace life the way it is, not life with rose-colored glasses on or life according to your preference, but life the way it is, then you would also say Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. It's also important to call Jesus God because if you want to know the answer to the question, what is God like? What we have in Jesus is not just a revelation of what God says, but who God is. Let me read verse 18 again to you. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Jesus is a revelation of God. Back in 1944, there was an Anglican priest named Tom Torrance, and Tom Torrance later became a theology professor in Scotland. Well, during the Second World War, Tom Torrance felt that as a Christian, he couldn't pick up a gun and kill other people. But he wanted to help the British war effort, and so he became a stretcher barrier. He, uh, he, bearer, he, he took one of the most dangerous jobs. He didn't have a gun. But he would go into the thick of battle with bullets flying all around him and, and he would pick up British wounded soldiers and carry them back to the field hospital. Well, one morning at the break of dawn, the Germans had attacked, it, uh, attacked a British position in Italy and, and Tom Torrance heard a man groaning. He was lying in a, a ditch young 20-year-old named Private Phillips. Private Phillips had been mortally wounded, and he was lying there, and he saw Tom, he saw, uh, Tom Torrance with his clerical collar on, and he looked up, and he said, Father, Father, is God like Jesus? Tom Torrance knelt down and held his hand, and he later wrote, he said, I assured this dying soldier that God was exactly like Jesus. That God had revealed himself in the face of Jesus and he could trust that God was like Jesus. I told him that and then he died. John says that the word was God. And what he's saying is, if you want to know the answer to the question of what God is like, the answer is God is exactly like Jesus. So when we ask, does God love children? We would answer, well, did Jesus love children? Did Jesus talk to children and kneel down and bless children? and love children, and hug children. Yes, he did. Therefore, God loves children. What does God think of women? Well, the answer is, well, what did Jesus think of women? How did Jesus treat women? 
And what we see is that Jesus always treated women with dignity, that he never judged a woman because she was pretty or on her looks. He never put a woman down because she was uh, stepped out of her particularly you know, culturally assigned role. He never used women as the butt of a joke. He, he never viewed women as superficial or too emotional. He, he never judged a woman uh, because he, she was thought to be too domineering. How does God view women? God views women exactly like Jesus. He loves women. How does God think of people who made a mess of their lives? Folks who uh, didn't listen to advice, rejected, you know, wisdom as it came towards them, thought that they knew better. How does God view people who make stupid choices in relationships, who married the wrong person, who got involved in the wrong activities, who maybe got involved in criminal activities? How does God view such people? Well, how did Jesus view such people. Well, Jesus had compassion on people who made a mess of their lives and made stupid choices and messed up relationships and rejected wisdom and rejected counsel. Jesus forgave people who asked him for forgiveness. That's what God is like. God forgives everyone, everyone who asks God to forgive them. Everyone who has regrets about things that they should have done or could have done or might have done better with their kids or their spouse or their parents or, or you know, a friend. Who is the baby born at Christmas 2,000 plus years ago whose birth we celebrate this Christmas Eve in the words of the Christmas carol that I drew this message from, Yea, Lord, we greet thee. Born this happy morning, Jesus to thee be all glory given. Word of the Father now in flesh appearing. Now in flesh appearing. The Christmas carol is simply quoting from John 1 verse 14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The Word became flesh. You know, this idea of... God becoming flesh is captured in the notion of incarnation. That's what we celebrate at Christmas, the incarnation of the true and living God. Now, for those of you who don't know what incarnation means or incarnate, it comes from the Latin incarne, which means in flesh. We say, you know, uh, you know, would you like chili con carne? It means chili with meat, chili with flesh. And what we're saying is that when God became incarnate, he came with meat, with flesh. It's really quite a shocking statement, incarne, in the flesh, because we're not just simply saying that God became a human being. We're saying that God took on our, you know, our frailties, our weaknesses, all that we are, that, that uh, when God came down, he, he took on our pains. He, he knows what it's like to be tired, to be hungry and thirsty. He knows what it's like to have a, a bellyache or a headache. Uh, God stepped out of heaven and he became a baby boy. And and he can sympathize with us. Christians claim what no other religion claims, that God knows exactly what it's like to live in this broken world. No other religion says that their God at one time in history uniquely stepped out of heaven, came down, and knows exactly what it feels like to live in a world that's torn by war and ethnic strife and prejudice and pandemics and, and disease and, and you know, uh, relational problems and all the rest. He's felt our hurts. He's experienced our pain. There's nothing awful in human experience that our God has not endured. 
I want to close uh, with a story. There's a wonderful story written a number of years ago called The Long Silence. And in the story, the author imagines the human race at the end of history. And they're gathered on a giant plain and people from all of history come forward. And they decide that instead of God judging them, they're going to judge God. They say, you know, God, we're tired of you judging us. We're going to judge you. And one woman steps forward and she pulls up the sleeve of her shirt and on her forearm there's a tattoo that she received in a Nazi extermination camp. And she says, God, what do you understand about my life? I was beaten. I was tortured. I was spit on. And then I was executed. A black teenager comes up. He pulls down the collar of his shirt and there's an ugly rope burn on his neck. And he says, God, I was tortured and I was hung on a tree for no crime other than being black. And witness after witness steps forward and each of them has a complaint against God. And they say, one person says, God, look at how lucky you are. You stay up in heaven where it's all sweetness in life. You don't know what it's like to be hungry or thirsty. You've never experienced war. You sit up there in heaven and sit on a cloud and everything is so nice for you. What do you know about what we've endured as blacks, as Jews, as a Japanese child in Hiroshima, as a disabled, paralyzed man sitting in a wheelchair? Before you're qualified to be our judge, God, we judge you. And the human race decides to render a verdict like a jury on God, and they say, okay, here's our decision. We condemn you, God, to be born as a man. And not only as a man, we condemn you to be first born as a little baby whose legitimacy will always be called into question, that there'll always be a cloud over your head about whether you're a bastard or not. There'll always be a stain. We further condemn you to be born a Jew, to be born of that group of people who have been most hated for most of history. And we give you a task that it will be so impossible that even your own family will think you're crazy. We condemn you to always be misunderstood by everyone. We condemn you to be Betrayed by your closest friends to be stabbed in the back by someone you trusted. And God, you're never allowed to get married. And you'll never know the joy of having a child or a grandchild. And we condemn you to face false charges. To be judged by a biased jury and then sentenced by a cowardly judge who's afraid of the mob. And then we condemn you to be taken out and stripped and spit on and tortured and then to die totally alone. No one to care for you. No one to comfort you. When the verdict was read... Suddenly, a silence falls over the court. No one breathed. No one spoke. No one moved. Because everyone in the courtroom realized that God had already served his sentence. See, 
The end of Christmas is Good Friday. This God who was born in the Word ended up on a cross. He experienced everything, everything that we go through. God knows what it's like to be little. That's what I'd like to do. You know, there's no better time to receive this God who came into the world than Christmas Eve. Can't think of a better time than to just say, I want a relationship with you, God. If you really are a God who came and you're seeking me, then I want to open up my heart and let you find me. And friend, wherever you are, maybe you're a child and you're listening right now, and you want Jesus in your life, child. Or you're a teenager and you say, gosh, I'm going through something I feel so far from God, but I want a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're an adult who was raised in church and you've wandered far away or whatever it is that you're going through where you say, I don't have a relationship with Jesus that's making a real difference in my life right now. I'm gonna ask you wherever you are this Christmas Eve to just open up your heart and say, God, I want a real relationship with you. Would you, wherever you are, bow your head and pray with me? And just pray this way and just say, dear Jesus, it really blows my mind what you went through. And as much as I can, I believe, Jesus, that you really are God come in the flesh. And that you really did what the Bible says you did. That you did those miracles and ultimately you did die on a cross. You came to pay for my sin and you rose from the dead. Jesus, this Christmas Eve, I come out from hiding And I say, I want a relationship with you. Please change my life. Change me, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 